Aloha, and welcome to Book, 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 where we discuss reading, writing, and everything in between and beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Forsythe, coming to you from Maui on the Think Tech live streaming network, broadcasting from our studio in downtown Honolulu. Today, we're talking to Maui's premier storyteller, performer, freelance writer, and radio and television personality, Kathy Collins. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Rita. Mahalo for having me. It's a pleasure. You're known as a storytelling comedic personality, and what a fascinating journey you've been on, beginning with your Japanese origins. Can you, can you tell us about that? Okay, well, I am um, my, my, uh, I'm a sansei, third generation Japanese. My mother's parents came to Hawaii from Hiroshima, and my father's parents came from Okinawa. Uh, so I always tell people I'm Japanese Okinawan, um, and I really identify more with the Okinawan culture, I think, just because it's, uh, it just seems a little more lively. But, um, and, and so, like most uh, Japanese American kids, my generation, I went to Japanese school after public school every afternoon and um, learned the Japanese language, reading, writing, and also the uh, folk tales. Uh, the very first book that I remember owning was uh, called Japanese Children's Favorite Stories. And being an only child, I um, that was my constant companion, this wonderful book with the very quaint illustrations. Uh, my dad taught me to read when I was two years old. I'm an only child. And um, all through my childhood, my father used to say, the greatest gifts, the two greatest gifts that he could give me, that any parent could give a child, was number one, teaching them to read, and number two, learning to appreciate music. And that is what he did for me. He, he taught me to read and, uh, and they never, never scrimped on, um, on providing me with reading material. I, my dad was a dentist. And uh, before I started school, I would go with him to his office and I'd read, I'd devour all the magazines in his, in his waiting room. Um, and the same thing with music. Once um, I was... I was uh, given the opportunity to join band in fifth grade. Um, if it had to do with music, um, my parents bought it for me. So I had, I had my clarinet, I had an oboe, I had guitars and ukulele and a drum set. Um, it's, uh, my dad truly believed that reading and music were the greatest gifts because once I received them, they could never be taken away from me. And they would always bring me joy and um, happiness throughout my life. And then he was right. Um, yeah. Especially as an only child, you know, I'm, books, books, books is the name of your show. And that's pretty much what my early life was like. Books, books, books. Yeah, yeah, me too. We spent a lot of time in the library and always would get our ma max out the 40 books per person. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. So one of the stories in that book that you were talking about, I believe, is, uh, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, Isun Boshi. Isun Boshi. And isn't that translated to the inch high samurai? Yeah, little one inch is, uh, <laughs> is the one they uh, translate it as. Well, tell us oh. more about that and uh, <laughs> perform that for us, if you don't mind. Um, I, I would love to. I, I should say that um, along with reading, I, as an only child and, and my, very much indulged by my parents, I used to, I would write plays and stories and perform them for them in the living room. Once I got into high school, I became really active in speech and drama competitions. And, um, and that's really how I got my start with the uh, being a storyteller and a radio personality, but we'll get to that later. So Isun Boshi is one of my favorite stories to tell. It was my favorite when I was a child, but I often tell it um, in my alter ego, Tira, because um, Tira only speaks in pidgin, and, um, and I'm 
I'm passionate about pidgin. I consider it the unofficial language of Hawaii and the true language of aloha. And uh, so hopefully all of our viewers are fluent in pidgin. If not, not to worry. I've done Isun Boshi in Canada in, uh, at the Lincoln Center Out of Doors Festival. Um, and nobody there spoke pidgin <laughs> as their native language, but they all understood it. So I'm pretty sure you'll get the, uh, the drift. But so here we go. Isun Boshi in the words of Tira. So I like to tell you one story about one guy named Isun Boshi. You guys ever heard of Isun Boshi? I know plenty of people never did. And you know why? Eh? The name Isun Boshi means little one inch. So if you was one Japanese boy and your name was little one inch, you know, can spread that around. Eh? But in Japan, this guy is famous. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell you the whole story. See, long, 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 long time ago in Japan had this old man and this old lady. They was married. There was a nice couple too, you know? Oh, all their life, they work hard. They cocoa their neighbors. They love each other. They was good guys, yeah? Life was perfect for them, except for one thing. They never had no keiki. And I was so sad, you know, because that's all they wanted was for have one baby that they could raise up for be one good upstanding citizen, you know, because they was Japanese, yeah. But I tell you, year after year go by, no more baby. Every night, yeah, when they go bed, they pray to their gods, oh, please send us a baby that we can love and, and cherish and nourish, yeah. Year after year, no more baby. Probably because all they do nighttime is pray, yeah. But anyway, so one day, the wahine was out in her backyard, yeah, in her daikon patch, pulling weeds, yeah. And then she spark something bright red inside the daikon patch. She goes, she pick him up. Was one little baby boy. One inch big, wrap up in one small little red blanket. Oh, so excited. She ran inside the house and she showed her husband. She go, oh, look, our prayer is answered. And her husband told, oh, but it's so small. Ah, but that's all right. We shall feed him. We shall take care of him. We shall teach him. We're gonna, we're gonna nourish him and cherish him. And one day he's gonna grow up to be big and strong. But for now, we call him Isun Boshi. And from that day on, yeah, Isun Boshi's mother and father, they took such good care of him. Isun Boshi's mother, she take her nicest kimono and she snip off small little pieces of material and she sew up shirt and pants for Isun Boshi. And Isun Boshi's father, he take his knife and he carve on small little table and chairs for a boy. And every year Isun Boshi grow more strong. Every year Isun Boshi grow more smart. But he never did grow more big. 16 years old, one inch tall. But on the day he turned 16, he went to his parents and he said, Mama-san, Papa-san, you've been so good to me. You take care of me like I your very own fresh and proud, even though I come from the daikon patch. Now, my turn, take care of you. I shall go out in the world. I seek my fortune. I come back and and take care of you so you no need to work no more in your whole life. Isuboshi's mother, she cry up. Eh? And even Isuboshi's father get one tear in his eye, but small kind though. And then Isuboshi's mother, she take her sharpest needle from her sewing kit 
and she gave them to Isun Boshi for him use as one sword for protect himself. Isun Boshi's father get his favorite chowang, his rice bowl, give them to Isun Boshi for him use like one boat. And then Isun Boshi's mother make one dozen small little spam musubis, put them in one small little bag and they send him down the road. And Isun Boshi drag in his rice bowl boat and his uh, needle sword and he get to the edge of the river. He jump inside his chawang boat and he take one chopstick and push himself off from the river bank and down the river he going, eating his spam musubi, thinking about how he going to earn his fortune because, you know, when you one inch big, your job opportunity is kind of limited, yeah? yeah. <sighs> no can be fisherman because the fish would eat him, yeah? No can be rice farmer. He would drown in the rice paddies, yeah? What he going to do? Oh, man. And then he was on his last spam musubi when he got the bright idea. I shall be samurai because I already have a sword. So Isumboshi decide he going to find the shogun's castle. He going to offer his services to the shogun. He going to be the number one Ichiban samurai in all Japan. And you know, a couple, three days later, floating down the river, he seen him. The shogun's castle, high on the mountainside, yeah? Who oh, he push his chowang boat to the side, he jump out and he start walking up, 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 up. Oh, took him long time because you know your legs only half inch long, take long time for cover distance. But Isuboshi no give up. Finally, he's standing right in front of the wooden doors of the shogun's castle and he call out, Haro, Haro. <coughs> the shogun's maid, she hear this calling. She opened up the door. Nobody there. She closed the door. She go back inside. <laughs> it's somebody, she try again. <coughs> she shout more loud. Hello! He, door open up. And he, uh, down here. Down here. The maid looked down, but all she sees is the geta, you know, the kind of high heel wooden slippers that the Japanese guys wear. Close the door, go back inside. <coughs> so, by now, the shogun hearing all this calm ocean, he wondering, what going on, eh? He come downstairs and he asked the maid, what's all this noise? And the maid tell, I think your slippers that I come inside, they're talking to me. The shogun think, oh, this lady poo-poo there already. He opened up the door. And by now, Isumboshi stay climb on top the geta, pull out his needle sword, waving them around so that he glisten in the sun. And he tell, down here, I am Isumboshi, small in height but still can fight. I wish to serve the Shogun. I wish to become number one Ichiban Samurai. Well, the Shogun seen that, yeah, right? He like boss laugh, yeah, but you know, like be rude. So he called for his daughter, the princess. Not a princess. She only like 13, 14 years old. When she seen this little one inch boy waving his needle around, eh? she like, oh, he's so cute. Oh, Papa son, we can keep him, please, please. And the shogun tell, if you wish, daughter, Isun Boshi, from now on, you shall be my daughter's pet. Uh, I mean, the uh, bodyguard. Oh. Isumboshi no can believe. He just meet the shogun and already the shogun trusts him for be his daughter's bodyguard. Oh, right then and there, he swear he would give up his life 
for protect the princess. From that day on, Isumboshi and the princess was best friends. Everywhere the princess go, Isumboshi riding on top her shoulder. The princess throw out all her dolls and make room for Isumboshi in her dollhouse. When she do her homework, Isumboshi help out. When she practice playing the koto, Isumboshi dance up. What are two guys? Best friends. So one day, was one gorgeous day. Isumboshi and the princess went for one walk in the deep forest right below the shogun's castle. Oh, the birds was singing, the sun was shining. It was one awesome day. And then all of a sudden, from behind one big tree, out jumped this oni. Now, one oni is one Japanese demon. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and colors. This one was green like limu. And he had scales like one fish all over his body. The guy was like eight feet high with horns coming out from his big bolo head. And no more teeth. Well, whatever teeth he had was rotten. Oh, that guy smelled pilau. He look at the princess and he tell what are you doing in my forest? And Isunboshi, on top of the princess's shoulder, he tell, your forest? No, no. This is a shogun's forest. This is shogun's daughter, the princess. And I am Isunboshi, small in height, but still can fight. I am princess bodyguard. And he jumped down to the ground, stand in front of the Oni. The Oni tell her, oh, 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 oh. Body God, <laughs> look like one little seamstress to me with your little needle. <laughs> I have a magic hammer. Pull out this big hammer, this mallet from his belt, and he go, Puh. I no need waste my hammer on you. He shoved the hammer back in his belt. He lift up one foot for smash Isunboshi. But Isunboshi, he too fast. He jump on the on his other foot. He take his needle sword and he poke him hard as he can. But the on his skin so tough with all the scales, he no feel nothing. The Oni grab for the princess. The princess start running away. And Isunboshi start climbing up. The Oni's legs scale by scale. <laughs> the princess running as fast as she can and hard, you know, running one kimono. Yeah, you got to take all small little steps. Good thing the Oni was so big and clumsy. He no could catch the princess as hard as he tried. She keep getting away from him. And Isumbo, she just keep climbing up and up the Oni's leg until he reached the belt with a magic hammer hanging. He reached out, he grabbed the hammer, but the thing too heavy, fall to the ground. Isumboshi no give up. He keep on going up the scales of the Oni's chest until he reached the shoulder. And then he yelled inside the Oni's ear, I am Isumboshi, small in height, but still can fight. The Oni hear that, he turned his head, he let out one, and as soon as he opened his mouth, Isumboshi jump inside, take his nails, poking him all over inside his mouth. The Oni spit Isumboshi out. He take off running out from the forest. Nobody ever seen him again. Well, he ran so fast, he forget his magic hammer on the ground. So the princess, she goes, she pick up the hammer, she shake off the dirt and the leaves. And every time she shake the hammer, Isumboshi grow one inch. Huh? 75 times she shake the hammer. Isumboshi end up six foot four. Huh? Good thing wasn't me because I would be like 33, 34. Nah, fam. Bugger would be three feet high. 
But the princess, good Japanese girl, she just keeps shaking the hammer. Isuboshi turned into one tall, handsome samurai. And the two of them, they go back to the castle. And, and the princess tell her father all what Isuboshi went do, how brave and loyal he was. Yeah? And the shogun tell, oh, Isuboshi, you truly are my number one Ichiban samurai. Whatever you wish is yours. Isumboshi tell, oh, I don't need nothing for me. But if my mama-san and papa-san could come and, and live in castle and no work anymore, I'd be so grateful. The shogun think, oh, good boy, this would make good son-in-law one day. He send his servants out to the countryside. They find Isumboshi's parents, bring them back to the castle. Couple, three years after that, Isumboshi and the princess get married and all them live happy ever after. So you know what is the moral of this story, eh? <laughs> Size no matter, so long as you get magic inside your hammer. This is one true story, honest promise. Oh, wonderful. Oh my gosh, that was so entertaining. Not I exactly how it. it's written in the book, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I love your use of pigeon and oh, beautiful, beautiful. I can really see how, uh, I, and you're writing a children's play, yeah? I mean, I can see how you can be so entertaining. <laughs> now tell you. us about MAPA, uh, Maui Academy of Performing Maui Arts. Maui Academy of Performing Arts has been around for decades and um for the last, oh, 25, almost 30 years, each school year, MAPA, um, the Academy, presents an educational play for children, and it tours through all of the preschools and the public elementary school and private elementary schools on the island. And uh, pre-pandemic, I was fortunate to be commissioned for three years in a row to write, write a story, which always has to have a lesson or a moral. And, um, and then I get to perform it along with a, a cast. Usually uh, we have two to three actors and a musician. We, we, we have live music with the performance and, and we tour the schools for four months, every Thursday and Friday, up to three performances. Oh, <laughs> that's me as Manu I.P. Lao, uh, the minor bird. That, uh, that's from the play Birds of a Feather in which the minor bird, the peacock, and the chicken all compete to become the next state bird because the nene has decided to retire. And so it's a, it's a really fun story. Oh, and that one was the first play I did for MAPA. It was a retelling of The Fisherman and His Wife, the Grimm's fairy tale, but Maui style. And so there I am as the magic ulua who grants the poor fisherman his wishes. And uh, that was great fun. That was a really interactive show with the kids. They had to be the ocean and they had to respond. And I really enjoy doing those shows for MAPA. Um, I am on the board of directors of MAPA and have been fortunate also to perform in several of their um, larger productions. Um, the most recent and the one of which I'm most proud is called Ahi Rap. Uh, Ten years ago, two local playwright actors, Derek Nakagawa and Francis Tau'a, were commissioned to write this story uh, along the lines of Greater Tuna, which is a comedy with two men playing all of the roles. And that is that we use the same device and it was called Lesser Ahi. They did a sequel the next year called Fresher Ahi, and they invited me to join them. So the three of us played 16 roles all together. And then for various reasons, it was supposed to be a trilogy. We never got to do it until just this past year. Um, so there I am as Jody, uh, whose real name is Joseph K. Aloha, uh, the drag queen or gender illusionist. Uh, Derek and Francis are there playing their female roles. There I am as the villainess, the only villain in the whole trilogy, um, Ilona, who is trying to seduce um, the patriarch of the family. They were high school sweethearts. Oh, that was, I love playing um, 
Jeanette, who is, uh, she, as you can see, she's really into anime and Hello Kitty and all of that. And, and so in love with uh, Jesse, the stoner, who's uh, flexing over there. <clears throat> oh, Auntie and Uncle Chin, a delightful old couple. He's kind of hard of hearing and he mumbles a lot. And then she, uh, she's kind of a dragon lady, but they do love each other. And they're also one. Well, I guess they're all my favorite characters, but I think my absolute uh, favorite. Oh, and it's not fair. Maybe it'll come up, but um, Roland Bang Bang Mecca Dang Dang. There, is. <laughs> there a, they are. <laughs> he's a wannabe uh, MMA fighter, and I have so much fun playing him. You see the Aquaman shirt that he's wearing? Yeah. Bang Bang says, yeah, would be Jason no more if it wasn't for me. I taught him everything he know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I wish I had another but, half hour to talk to you. I wanted Well, to you know what? I do want to encourage everybody to go if that, with a, you know, that kind of piqued your curiosity. Uh, he rap in two parts is now available online streaming. You pay what you can or will or wish. Um, go to mauiacademy.org. That's the Maui Academy of Performing Arts. mauiacademy.org. And there'll be a link to uh, stream the, the, per the productions online. Oh, thank you so Had much. to get that plug in. Yeah, good, good. Uh, you know, and I wanted to talk about how you opened for Rita Rudder and Howie Mandel and how you write comedy and all of your lips. So we'll have to have you back. We'll just have uh, to do it again. I'm sorry but, I took so much time with Isu no, Moshi, no, but that did. is my favorite story. And I get to see you on Friday because town parties are coming back. On yes, ooh, ooh, I ooh. am hosting Kihei fourth Friday. Yeah, Yay, Friday. after over two um, years. Oh, we are so excited here in Kihei. No, oh, that's all the time we have today. I better get going. I want to thank Kathy and our broadcast engineer, our floor manager, and Jay Fidel, our executive producer. A special mahalo to our underwriters, and thank you for joining us. Books, books, books. We'll be back in two weeks. Until then, read, write, and create your world. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.